Welcome, Transformation Talk Network listeners. My name is Ellen Stewart, and I am the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged, where we share advice and assistance from experts in addiction and recovery. I am so thrilled to talk about this topic today, and ladies especially, this one is for you. And it's such an important topic that I have decided to do a call-in today. So if you have questions concerning anything that we're talking about today, I want you to call in and let us know. And that number is 800 930 2819. If you're looking online, it's up on the screen and I will be sharing it with you throughout the program. We are very thrilled to bring you this very important episode. From all of the work that I do in recovery, of course, a great deal of my clients are women. Their, their addiction issues may be harder to spot. Some women's fears about getting help for addiction are difficult than men. Last week, last time on the show, I had a, an expert on men's issues in recovery, and now I have to di- decided to do a show specifically about addiction in women, causes, warning signs, and most importantly, treatment. I have brought on a professional as always to help me share this time with you and to get the information we need and maybe help a loved one out there who is struggling. Today's guest is Erin Goodhart. Erin is an expert in families and addiction. She's also an expert in co-occurring disorders, teens and young adults, and she is an expert in clinical supervision and professional development for women and also in trauma. She is a licensed professional counselor, a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, a certified clinical supervisor, an advanced certified relapse prevention specialist, and certified sex addiction therapist. She is highly trained in cognitive processing therapy and has earned provider status. She is at Karen Treatment Center in Wernersville, Pennsylvania, which is a treatment center that I talk about a great deal on this show because I know it to be the gold standard for treatment in this country among some of the other places that I recommend. And I brought this expert on today to talk about women's issues in recovery. Transformation Talk Network listeners, Recovery Recharge Program followers, welcomes Erin Goodhart. Good morning, Erin. How are you? I'm good, Ellen. Thank you so much for having me on this morning. You are very welcome. So according to the Recovery Research Institute, which is part of Massachusetts General Hospital, which is an affiliate of Harvard Medical School, there are so many challenges that women face in both addiction and recovery. First of all, why is it harder or is it harder to spot addiction issues in women? It is much harder to spot addiction issues in women. Women tend to keep their substance use secretive. They tend to use alone. um, And it really tends to be something that they experience a lot of guilt and shame about. So why do you think they tend to be alone? What happens? Are they are they afraid to share it with other girlfriends? I mean, what's the process? What do women tell you? Yeah, part of what they say to me is that they're very fearful about the perception of them drinking out in public. And the other part of that too is that for some women, that 
drinking or substance use at the end of the night, if they've accomplished all of their needs for the day, they don't see it as problematic. Ah, so they see it as a reward for a very tough day. Yeah, and also as a way to um, relax and kind of celebrate that I got the kids, I got the house, I got to work, I did all, all of the things that I need to do in order to look productive and successful. So it's kind of their checklist, right? Their own personal reward situation. I see. And why do you think they're so isolated? Do they? Do you find that women find it hard to talk about with other women? That they may have some issue which doesn't make them perfect? Yeah, I mean, I think as a culture, we tend to shy away from talking about difficult things, even with close friends. And certainly something like substance use that can impact their relationships, their children, their jobs, um, people tend to keep that really, you know, secretive and close. I also find with women, especially young women um, and and young young adult women that are going through school, that it that the issues are not so easy to spot because they're not getting into trouble. They're not doing anything that would overtly signal something is wrong. Do you find that the case? Yeah, and often, especially with our young adults, they find their way into mental health treatment much sooner than they find their way into substance use treatment. So people, especially young adult women, will be getting treatment for anxiety or depression, but underlying that is a substance use disorder. So it's easier for a woman to talk about their anxiety, their depression, than it is to talk about something like a mm -hmm. substance abuse problem. I also find, and we'll talk about this, of course, in depth, but women do fall prey to process addictions like eating disorders, sometimes a little bit more than men. Do you find that to be the case? Absolutely. And that is, you know, one of the real challenges in addressing substance use disorders with those co-occurring process addictions. Um, you know, you put down the alcohol or substance, then we see that eating disorder behavior really quick up, kick up and vice versa. Well, that makes it extremely difficult to spot. And also we're talking, let's go back a little bit to about women's fears of the women that I handle that either are coming, come out of a treatment center like Karen, or they're thinking about going in, they're always concerned with how they look to the outside world. Am I, tr I need to be perfect so that people can see me as a perfect wife, a perfect mother. Talk a little bit about that and, and uh, women's addiction issues. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. That That's part of the challenge with women seeking treatment is they really look at, um, you know, if I have this, substance use disorder, that means that I'm a failure in some way and that I can't manage life. And, um, you know, part of that perfectionism then can also, and I'm sure we'll talk about this as we talk about the recovery process, can also bleed into what recovery means to women also. Yes. And, and we'll go back and talk about this as well, but in simple, basic things, right? I talk to women that, you know, the holidays are coming up, even something like Halloween to make it perfect for the kids. I need exactly the right candy. I need exactly the right costume for the kids. Everything has to be just so, or for some reason, I am not a good enough mother right? It's not perfect enough for them. Or they're, they feel always, and I feel with women, they seem to feel that they, they are judged more. That whole idea of people judging them for how good a mother they are. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, women, I, I think women more than men worry so much about judgment and worry about the perception that other people have of them. And then that is something I hear from women all the time. They're so worried about what their friends and the other moms are going to think about them. Let's go straight to a break. Stay with us, please. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
There we go. Sorry for that. Welcome, Transformation Talk Network listeners. Again, my name is Ellen Stewart. I'm the pushy broad from the Bronx. Welcome to my show, Recovery Recharged. We're doing a wonderful show today about women's issues in addiction and recovery with my guest, Erin Goodhart, licensed professional counselor. We are doing a talk show question show today. Please call in with your questions. 1-800-930-2819. Erin, I was talking about how women sometimes will not go into treatment because they feel they will be abandoning their children. Let's talk about that. Somebody really needs help. It's very, very difficult. They don't want to leave their children. What's going through their minds? It's totally driven by fear and anxiety. And one of the things that I think is really helpful, though, about women kind of working through that level of anxiety is that on the other end of it, they're going to be the best parent that they can possibly be and really be able to show up for their kids in a way that they haven't been able to before. And we know that's an amazing thing. The The hard part is getting them there. But the good news, like you said, is that based on some of the things that we know, women who receive substance abuse treatment fare very well. They do very well in treatment and they relapse less often than men. Are you finding that the case in the treatment center? Yeah. One of the things that I say to our women all the time is communities get well together. It's amazing when you see a woman walk into treatment, fearful, full of shame, unsure of what to expect. And there's a group of women who just come around them and rally. And then, you know, to hear the updates from them and to see that connection that they build in treatment is is truly one of the blessings of this. There's nothing stronger than a tribe of women. Women helping women always enhances and strengthens each individual woman. There is no question. Besides, you know what it is, women reach out and do ask for support and for help a lot more than men do, right? One woman will turn around and say, I need help. They may not say what it is, but they know they need help and will get to it faster. Don't you think? I do. And I meet with patients in detox, women in detox here, and and they'll say to me that the scariest and bravest thing they ever did was to tell somebody in life that they were struggling and to really see the support that they got from their family and friends. Yes. And to also know that they're not alone. There are so many women going through the same thing. And if you are one of those women, or you know, one of those women, or you have a particular question to ask our expert today, please call in 1-800-930-2819. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Is it true? Let's let's just cover some of the myths here and legends and and from your perspective, let us know what's real and what's imagined. Do women become addicted more quickly than men? Yeah, I think that what happens for women is they metabolize substances different from men. So even using the same amount as a male, they're going to appear more under the influence or more intoxicated. And um, I think as we said earlier, women come into treatment later. So their substance use is more progressed. So they can look sicker than men by the time they get into treatment. Uh, So they wait so long to finally make the decision to come. Mm -hmm. That's a key thing for us out there, for women out there. Don't wait, get the help that you need today. It's the most important thing. So let's talk about the kind of substances that women are more likely to use, because maybe you can spot this within yourself and you have an idea whether something in particular is a problem. What kind of substances do women usually generally abuse? So what I see a lot is um, women using alcohol. And again, I think it ties into part of the um, way that they look at it is it can feel glamorous, right? So I'm going to sit down and have a glass of wine at, at the end of the night. And so when they paint that picture in their mind, it doesn't look like maybe somebody who's using um, illicit drugs or going to a drug dealer. It, f- it seems more glamorous and acceptable to them. And how many women do do you know, or how many women I know I have worked with that that become the transportation for their children, right? They're going to dance classes, they're going to, to soccer classes, football classes, 
you know, martial arts classes, you're, you're chauffeuring your kid all, all around. And then you're meeting other friends, other girlfriends for lunch in the afternoon and, and having what you consider to be a harmless glass of wine or two. How often do you see that, Erin? I, I see that a lot, Ellen. And, and really though, that's the way it starts for people is it starts as I can drop my kids off at school, get to the whatever I have in the morning, go to lunch, have a glass or or two of wine and still be able to pick my kids up. When we see the progression happen is when they're calling other people to pick their kids up or they're um, not showing up to the soccer practice or the soccer game. And so that's really when women tend to see things spinning out of control. I completely understand. And, and the legal limit is so little that two glasses of wine is already over the legal mm-hmm. limit in most states. Mm-hmm. So we understand that this builds up continuously. And as we said, it is not only substance use which can get away from us. And it doesn't mean that we had to start drinking as women at 14 or 15 years old, right? We can we could have started at any time, correct? Absolutely. And I will say with the pandemic, we actually saw women coming into treatment at an older age and more progressed in their disease. And one of the things that we really noticed is because those um, natural boundaries were taken away. So there wasn't soccer practice, there wasn't dance practice, there wasn't school. So the things that women tended to use to box in their, their substance use, those were gone. So we really saw a progression in people's substance use, especially women. And and of course, with the pandemic and everything being delivered and the fact that you can have what you want immediately, you can order from all of these places, alcohol delivered to the door and everything else available to you, it 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 stretches the gamut. And you're you're all, you're not only seeing it with women with children, correct? What you're saying is it's bridging generation gaps, correct? Absolutely. And again, I think um you know, what we're also seeing is our young adult women coming in. Um, and now they're the population that we see more using the illicit substances, um, you know, and they're the ones who are also, even if they're a younger age, very progressed in their substance use and co-occurring disorders. I see. So let's talk a little bit about young adults, because I know I work with so many college kids Mm -hmm. and I find that men are more likely to be introduced to illicit drugs by their friends. What about women in contrast? Yeah, um, women who use illicit substances, especially young adults, they tend to be introduced to them by their partners. Um, They tend to use together with their partner. I think in some cases it gives them a sense of safety um, that they're with someone they know, someone they trust. Um, uh, but, But that's certainly been something that we've seen an increase in over the last several years. Ladies, if you are dating somebody that is an illicit drug user, you have to be very, very, very careful that this does not rub off on you. If this is you and you want to talk about it and you want to get some help, please, please make an appointment with me at Pushy Broad from the Bronx. You can call me at 1-800-889-1757. If you have a question for Erin Goodhart today about women's addiction issues, please call in today at 800-930-2819. It's a very interesting topic today and very informative. So I also found that women get addicted to pills a little faster than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Why and how does that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it can happen for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that we see in our women's unit is this interesting combination of substance use chronic pain and often trauma, trauma, um, you know, symptoms, PTSD as a combination. And so what we know about painkillers is they kill the physical pain, but they can also numb out and help manage the emotional pain that people experience from their co-occurring disorders or trauma histories. 
And that, of course, is something that does often separate men and women Mm -hmm. because women are victims of trauma, maybe a little bit more often than men and have to find ways to escape from that. Correct? Yeah. And often if if they're not, um, if women don't get trauma treatment, it can come out in their body, right? We all know the body keeps the score. And so we do see that chronic pain connection for women who have trauma histories. And isn't it true that women may develop health issues more quickly from substance use than men? Talk about Mm -hmm. that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I can think of off the top of my head, probably five or six women that we've had in treatment in the last six months who liver cirrhosis, kidney problems, um, you know, very fragile, very medically compromised. And, And we just don't see that as often on the men's units. And also we see it for a much smaller amount of consumption, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I think that goes back to so many things. It goes back to um, physiology of the way women process substances. I, you know, I have seen a lot of women, it's tied into hormones. It's tied into menstruation. It's tied into um, menopause, all of those things. And even, you know, for our young adults, that transition that happens hormonally in their 20s and how that really can um, impact the way the substances are processed as well. Well, we all know what a big problem it is in in substance abuse and and everything that a woman has to deal with in trying to get the time and the feeling that they really want to come into treatment. Once they get here and once they begin to work with you, what kind of programs are available? How do you talk to them? How do they, how do they begin to change their lives? The one thing that I always start with with women is truly having relationship with themselves. I think sometimes we can get really focused on our relationships with other people and how um, we need to adjust them. But with all women, I'm a huge fan of have a relationship with yourself, figure out what you like, what you don't like, Um, start to build that internal self-esteem. And that's when you start to see the light bulbs go off. And how often do you find that women have never had a chance to do that? Oh, Ellen, I'd say overwhelmingly many of our women will say, I never had a voice. I never was able to say I like this or I don't like this. In fact, I didn't even know what I like sometimes, right? <laughs> um, so for the first time in treatment, we're giving them this opportunity and bolstering them up to be able to love themselves at their core. Women are always concerned. We're always caregivers. We are always thinking beyond ourselves, whether it's our partner, our parents, our children, whatever it is, our girlfriends, other people in the world, women are natural caregivers, which means we always seem to think of everybody else before we think of ourselves. And because of that, we can lose our identities and we don't understand what really is good for us. And we can't appreciate how to love ourselves. And sometimes it takes going away, spending some time to clear ourselves up and get into a good treatment center, which allows us to be who we are. And for some people, the first time in their lives, correct? Yeah. And the other side of that too, is we begin to build trust in our other relationships that you know, someone else can get the kids to practice. They can get lunch together. Uh, My job is going to survive without me. And so we start to build trust within ourselves, relationship with ourselves and trusting vulnerable, authentic relationships with the people around us. You're absolutely right. And that's part of the, I don't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I can delegate. I can allow someone else to be there for my kids and it will be okay. Yeah. And I think too, you talk about part of that fear of what prevents women coming into treatment for some women. And we've, I spent tons of therapy sessions talking about this with women. What is it like for you not to be the person there kind of quarterbacking everything? What is your fear that, am I going to be needed when I get home? Is my family going to know that they can survive without me? Is work going to be able to, you know, not fall apart? And so that can also be part of the fear of what prevents women coming into treatment. 
we always feel like we're holding up the world, even though, <laughs> even <laughs> though, even though men think they are, but women, of course, think the same way, right? Mm -hmm. We're the integral part. We hold all the pieces together. The whole world will collapse if we go away. And what kind of wife am I then? What kind of mother am I? What kind of partner am I if I'm showing weakness, right? The whole world is going to fall apart without me. Is that pretty much what's happening? What yeah, you see? that is what I see with the women. And the, the really um, interesting thing is one of the things that is helpful for women is for them to have some access. I know with my kids, everything is virtual, you know, every piece of communication. And so I can imagine coming into treatment in 2023 and not having access to any of that. All that would do is increase my fear, my anxiety, you know, my preoccupation. And so sometimes I'm having a little access to be able to check their kids' grades or to check their email helps um, eliminate some of the excuses they might give not to seek treatment. And that's a very good thing. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about how treatment for women is really beneficial, the kinds of treatment that people that we deal with at not only at Karen Treatment Center, but the kind of things that women could look forward to in treatment. If you have a question, jot down this number, 800-930-2819. We'll be back right after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Women's Issues in Recovery. I'm Ellen Stewart. This is the Pushy Broad from the Bronx. I'm here with clinician Erin Goodhart, who is talking about women's issues in addiction and recovery. We're having a very interesting conversation. If you have questions about anything that we're covering this hour, or you have questions for our clinician, please call 800-930-2819. Thank you so much. So Erin, let's continue our discussion about a women's issues in early recovery, right? They come out of treatment or they're really just beginning to maintain sobriety and they want to avoid relapse dangers. What do women have to watch out for? I think the biggest thing is um, being thoughtful about not taking on too much. Um, especially coming out of residential treatment, women are going to want to kind of jump right back in and take on all their responsibilities. And I know it's a cliche, but really keeping their recovery first and knowing that the other things are going to follow. You know, you say that, and and what happens is many, many times I I am lucky enough to work with people in early recovery. That's a lot of what I do. So when somebody comes out of care and treatment centers and other treatment centers across the country, they start working with me right after they come out of treatment. And every single woman, not a man, because they have their own set of issues and everything, but every single woman I work with in the first week of recovery thinks that all of a sudden they have to go and become Wonder Woman. They have to do everything. They have to fix everything. They have to clean the house. They have to make all the meals. They have to go in there, not only like they never left, but 10 times better than they were before. As if the whole family expects them to be cured and they have to go back to prove their self-worth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is a very big mistake. I always tell them when you're coming out of treatment, if you are learn or, or if you are not in treatment, but you have gone into detox or you have decided to put down the drink or the drug and you are staying clean and sober and you are going to meetings and you are doing the right thing that you have to treat yourself like a new puppy. Nice and easy does it. There is no need for perfection. In fact, in recovery, we say it's progress, not perfection, okay? One step, one day at a time. And then, of course, talk to me about how Karen treats the secondary diagnosis, because that's something that also women struggle in early recovery. What are the, some of the secondary diagnoses or secondary situations that women have to worry about? Yeah, I mean, I think the most glaring one that we um, touched on earlier was trauma and abuse that women experience throughout their lifetime. 
Um, and knowing that even if something happened in their childhood, if they're still having um, symptoms now, they're still nightmares, flashbacks, reactivity. Being able to address that in early recovery is just as important as being able to address the substance use. And I would say that's true for many co-occurring disorders that we see, anxiety, depression. Um, you know, those are the top ones that come to my mind, obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, but there may be an increase in those symptoms and it, having therapy and being able to develop coping skills for emotional regulation, um, you know, uh, Rehab's prevention skills, all of those things are going to be important to keep tied together. You know, some of the some of the work that people do in trauma and abuse are very, very important, especially when someone is clean and sober, so that they can become aware of what's going on and they can face their issues head on. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, says that approximately 75% of women who have past substance abuse issues had a history of physical and or sexual abuse. That is devastating, don't you think? Absolutely. And and I think that that's also can be part of the challenge for women seeking treatment. We have a lot of women who come in who have experienced traumas in previous treatment settings. And so coming into another setting can be very, very scary. On the other side, I've worked with many women um, in trauma treatment early in their recovery process. And those connections that happen really set the tone for a, a beautiful early recovery process. And that's so hopeful for everyone out there. Mm -hmm. Please understand that there is hope, there is genuine recovery, and you do see that every day. Yes? Absolutely. You know, we, we see women connecting for the first time in a genuine way. Um, we see their recognition that um, their substance use may have been the only way they survived their life. Um, you know, without it, they they probably wouldn't be walking this earth, some of the things that I hear from these women. So initially they had to do something to protect themselves and now they're learning to stand on their own two feet, which is a wonderful thing and go past that trauma and abuse. But if not, if trauma and abuse wasn't necessarily a part of your life, maybe something else is that can, that is, that constitutes a, a co-occurring disorder like anxiety or depression or bipolar. Uh, and also maybe you are now coming out and are free of substances is, but now we're worried about a cross addiction. Erin, tell us what that is. Yeah. So what we can see again, specific to women, we tend to see the eating disorders popping up. Um, we tend to see a lot of over exercising um, and really using relationships in a way that um, is similar to the way they may have used substances um, with the obsession with the relationship, compulsion in the relationship, doing things for other people that they can do for themselves. Or one of the things that I always worried about personally, and that was shopping. <laughs> yes. How and, much and now shopping the internet. <laughs> can I do? Right? How much pointing and <laughs> clicking can I do? Is that you out there? If it's you and you want to talk about women's issues in recovery, please call us. We don't have too much longer to the end of this program. And you can always reach me afterwards and we can we can talk about this in depth. But if you have questions today, it's 800-930-2811. One nine. So it's not only worrying about everything else that comes out, but if you are in a good space, make sure that you are not going overboard in another area of your life, focusing on relationships, focusing on sex or work or shopping or, or, or things of that nature, or too much on your children or too much in pleasing a relationship and remembering who you are and how good it is to come out and have a relationship with yourself. And most importantly, to understand that you're not being selfish, you're not being self-centered, but you are being self-healing. Isn't that correct? It is. And that's one of the things that I talk about often with our women is um, early recovery is really about having appropriate self-care 
that keeps you spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically connected. And that's going to look different from person to person, but really prioritizing yourself so you can be fully available for other people in your life. And because of that, what we try, what you try to do it, Karen, is to automatically set women up to prevent them from relapsing, correct? Let's talk a little bit about, now I know Karen also has a relapse program. Let's just talk a little bit briefly about the kinds of things that bring women into that relapse zone that differ from men. Part of it is the um, co-occurring disorders that we talked about earlier, Some of it also is um, that stress, that feeling alone. Um, We do a lot of, um, you know, relapse prevention work with our, with our women, having um, connection with other women in recovery who they can talk with and who can give them support, um, difficulty managing emotions. um, And and for someone, it can also be, you know, I'm feeling really well. And so I kind of let my guard down a little bit. The way everybody else says, right? I'm feeling really good, so I'm not going to keep it up, right? I'm feeling really good, so I've got this, I've got it handled, and I'm just going to stay further and further away from recovery because I think I have it. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that always takes us down. But there is good news in terms of relapsing. A UCLA study of more than 300 people from 26 treatment programs found that over the course of six months, 32% of men relapsed while only 22 Two percent of women relapsed. And part of that is because of the things that Erin was saying. We do enjoy good, robust social support, correct? We like to be in a community. Yeah, women are, are uh, relationship-based beings. And when you find, like you said earlier, your tribe and people you connect with, that's when the beauty of this recovery thing happens for people. Women are more likely to finally ask for help. They are more likely to embrace that help. They are more likely to dive in and do the right thing. Once they see that other women around them are doing the same thing, they don't feel that alone. But the danger sometimes is when they let their negative emotions get the best of us. So talk a little bit about that and the relapse potential. Yeah, I mean, again, I think that women, you know, that perfectionistic piece that we've talked about is, is it's very difficult to engage in a conversation and say, I'm really struggling, or, you know, these are the negative thoughts that are running around in my head because the thought is I can get through this on my own, or, um, I don't need to ask for help in this situation. And so one of the things that we really challenge our women to do every day is take a look, honestly, at what were my negative thoughts today? Did I ask for help? Um, did I challenge negative thoughts? And, and you get in the pattern of identifying because there's nothing wrong with them. We all have them. So the idea is to begin to do some self-talk, yes, some some inner dialogue. What is going on with me? And to begin to question that. And one of the best ways that women can begin to do that is to understand that we can take time for ourselves. We can center ourselves. We can say, what's going on with me today? Not what's going on with my kids or the house or cooking or shopping or finances or my husband or my partner or whatever, but what's going on with me, the getting in touch with what do I need and how am I fulfilling myself? That would be a help, correct? Yeah. And really, you know, all those other behaviors that you mentioned, when you're thinking about engaging in them, I will tell people, take two minutes and check in. What what am I feeling in my body? What are my emotions that I'm having right now? What are my thoughts? Are the behavior that I'm going to engage in Am I using it to avoid an uncomfortable emotion, feeling, or situation? Because that's a that's a red flag for people. I one of my very first programs here with Transformation Talk Radio Network, and one of my very first podcasts was seeing red flags and not ignoring those red flags, not going down the same situation over and over again, but stopping short of that happening, especially since. According to to a lot of research, women tend to be more impulsive when they relapse. So that if they're not stopping ahead of time and saying, what am I doing? What's going on? The relapse tends to be instantaneous. Have you found that in your relapse groups? 
Absolutely. And, and the women will often say, I don't know where it came from. Um, and part of what we encourage people to do is really look back, you know, two, three months ago, were there things that changed? Um, were there times when you weren't using your support system, you were going to recovery supports, but not sharing, you were feeling stressed and alone. You were going back to old thinking. Um, but I will say the women tend to say like, I don't know. I just picked up one day. Right. I don't know how I got here. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I have seen. in so many women, all of a sudden, I don't know how I got here, which is why as a recovery coach, I make sure that they're grounded and that they know exactly how they got there. They know exactly where this is coming from. And I know you sent the basis of that at, at Karen treatment centers. And I know in the, in the traditional program and in the relapse program as well. So what happens when we are fairly strong in recovery, let's look at this. What's on the what's on the horizon for women? What kind of programs are available for women at Karen? And what is it like to be proud in recovery? Let's let's go there. That is one of my most rewarding parts of my job is when I see a woman walk out of treatment with their head held high, with integrity. Um and, and, and like, I was like an assertive woman in recovery, you know, being able to have a relationship with themselves, have relationships with other people, have difficult conversations and survive them, not have to use the substance or behavior to get through it. And that's an absolutely wonderful thing because on top of that strength, that inner strength it allows them to bring that strength back to their families. Yes. Do you see the follow-up sometimes? Are you able to see how it, how it trickles down? Absolutely. One of the things that we have here at Karen is a yearly um, alumni reunion. And I'll see women come back as groups of women who came through treatment together and they're smiling and laughing and stayed in a hotel the night before together. I'll see them come back with their kids. I'll see them at chapel services and just like, crying and hugging and, and that experience of joy. So, um, you know, I think we have an opportunity to break a cycle that people were often stuck in before they even came into treatment. And that is one of the things that I think is so helpful for children. A, a woman in recovery can say to their kids, I wish I'd handled that differently. Mommy's sad. Mommy's angry. Mommy's happy. You know, we, we start to change the narrative around talking authentically with our kids also. So we're talking about not only an increased feeling of self-development, right? Shedding old process, old patterns, old things that weigh upon us, becoming a better self and also becoming a better parent in the process. Yeah. And really being able to show not only our children, but other people in our lives that we can have difficult conversations and not crumble from them, that it's okay to have the whole range of emotions, right? And admit when we've done something wrong and, and do something differently next time. To me, that's the beauty of recovery. You're absolutely right, which is why I am 38 years clean and sober and extremely proud of it and see how much over the years so many things have changed in my life, the communication with people, my relationships, my understanding of things and my own self-development. And this is a great thing. So beginning to love yourself, beginning to put yourself first in a good way and really having that transcend to everybody around you so that it's very no noticeable, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and carrying that legacy on, I, I just think about the the ways that women can change the way that culture is. I just truly believe that. And sometimes maybe today it starts with a phone call. It starts with a question. And if you have one of those, please call 800-930-2819. We'll get your question on the air. We've still, we've got about seven minutes left to the end of the show. So if there's something you want to know, we'll be happy to answer it for you. Or you can go to pushybroadfromthebronx.com and make arrangements to have a session with me for a free consultation. And like, we can talk about what's going on with you and how to get you to some help. 
so that we can really begin to rediscover ourselves. As Aaron said, we become hopeful in recovery, however we get clean and sober, whether it's through treatment or whether it's through the rooms or whether it's through listening to programs like this and understanding that we can recover. So we're in a situation where this is the time of year where everything happens, all right? All the holidays happens, the partying happens, the who's going to make dinner, who's going to do this, who's going to do that. What kind of pressures happen for women this time of year? This is probably the highest pressure pressure cooker for women, um, short of like high school and college graduations for their children, um, because sort of the stereotype is that the the female or the woman in the, in the situation is going to just manage everything and, and have the nice dinner and entertain and show up for the entertainment. So this is a very, very stressful time for women. I am talking to women already. The women that I handle as clients that are turning around and telling me I've got this Halloween costume and I've got made this, uh, you know, a, a, a big thing and, and we're going to do this party and we have to make sure my child is exactly what they want. And then where is Thanksgiving going to be? And I'm doing my Christmas shopping. What advice are you giving the women out there, Erin? Oh, my God. It just goes on and on. It does. And, and the, the advice that I give to women is often the most uncomfortable piece of advice they'll hear, which is it's okay not to do it all. It's okay to have boundaries. And I encourage people to start thinking now about what Thanksgiving and, um, you know, Christmas and New Year's and what those holidays are going to look like and what you can tolerate and what you can and start to lay the groundwork now. Um, because this is really the biggest thing with holidays is boundaries and knowing your bandwidth. And being okay with it doesn't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it might be different this year than it has been in other years. And that's okay too. Exactly. It really, really is, which means rely on that community, rely on those people to help you out, make it a potluck Thanksgiving, make it a potluck Christmas, have everybody bring a dish, or even better yet, go to somebody else's house. It doesn't have to be in your house, in your kitchen, or go to a restaurant. Your kids will love you no matter what. It's not about the meal. It's not about the food. And it's not about the presence, correct? Absolutely. And start now putting your reserve coping strategies together. Don't wait until you know, you're stressed with Halloween or Thanksgiving or any of the other holidays. Start now practicing those healthy ways to have appropriate self-care that meets your needs. So you have reserve when you're stressed. And that's a really good thing. Can we give can we give people a few other little examples of what you tell the women about how to set up your boundaries and some of the things that, that you might want them to know? Yeah, the biggest thing that I would say, just as an overarching theme, is don't try to avoid letting the holidays be an excuse not to to get into treatment or to stay in recovery it's really easy to put other things before the recovery process um but really if 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 you have your your meeting your support system your healthy exercise your spiritual check in those are the things that that really need to be priority and maybe you go to thanksgiving dinner for you know an hour and a half instead of making it a whole day affair and sometimes that's very difficult for us because we think that we're not good enough or we haven't done it well enough. And then we go back to the, somebody will judge me for the fact that it's not what, what everybody else really wants, right? So how do we get around that? How do we stop thinking what other people think of us is important? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a process in itself. Um, what I would also suggest though, in moments like that, lean into the support system who are going to be proud of you for not having to do it perfect, for having boundaries, for prioritizing yourself and your health. Lean into those people because there is always going to be the people who are going to are going to point out the things that you're not doing well. And what I encourage people to consider, even if it's family, are those the people that you want to surround yourself in recovery? 
All right. Well, that's a big thing. So let's take some time with that. Let's spend about a minute or so and give us your message. And also, I'd like you to say something to the loved ones Mm -hmm. of this particular woman that is struggling. How can the loved ones help this particular woman, especially this time of year? What do you want them to know? The biggest thing that I would say to loved ones is have the courageous conversation with the people in your life who are struggling. It's scary, it's fearful, it's overwhelming, but I assure you the person in your life who is struggling is feeling just as fearful, overwhelmed, and they may actually welcome the courageous conversation and it might be an opportunity to open the door for wellness for your family. And of course, never to give up, correct? No, absolutely. There's there's always hope. In my mind, always, always hope. You never know when the miracle is gonna happen. And that's a wonderful thing. There are so many good treatments available for women out there if they're courageous enough to take the first mm-hmm. step. If you are that woman, please go to pushybroadfromthebronx.com. I will make sure that you get the, the right information. I thank Erin Goodhart, licensed professional counselor from Karen Treatment Center, that's C-A-R-O-N in Pennsylvania. And and they are there to help women, especially in treatment. Erin, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx saying thanks for listening. And everybody needs a little push. See you next time. This is Ellen Stewart, the pushy broad from the Bronx, saying thanks for listening. And remember, everybody needs a little push. From the pushy broad from the Bronx, New York.